So I have to confess, I was super locked in to your introduction in the first service, but uh, as you were introducing me just now, my, my nine-year-old is blowing up my phone, just going, hi, <laughs> I mean, she's going, dad, 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 <laughs> snowflakes, smiley faces, dad, 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 <laughs> so I'm going, honey, I'm about to speak, <laughs> give the phone to mom, I love you, and so I, I didn't quite receive the power I know, it must have been anointed. <laughs> so I was like, shh, shh, stop. Anyways. It's, it is so good to be here. It's, uh, it's, it's a joy. I mean, 10 years to the day. Is that for real? Like 10 years to the day? That's crazy. That's unbelievable. The, um, I mean, it's believable, but it's just, I probably shouldn't overuse that word. It's very American of me. The... Um, it's uh, I, I'll, I'll preach in, you know, Brazil, and they'll translate me, and, and I'll laugh every time because I'll use all these American massive superlatives like phenomenal, stupendous, amazing, astonishing, and they always translate it the same way. They always use the same word, mutabon, mutabon, mutabon. And I always go, no, not very good, astonishing. <laughs> That has nothing to do with anything. It's good to uh, <laughs> it's good to be here on the ten year anniversary. That's profound. I, I am I am moved. It's um, the the thing that moves me in that God did something remarkable ten years ago. It's it's the underlying why behind the what when the Lord does that kind of thing when He does. It's just, it's often because he wants to knit stories and, and families together. And so, um, and so when the Lord, you know, because again, he could move through anyone at any time. He could move, the, the, we're, we're just kind of sweet, broken, simple, miss it all the time vessels for that which he wants to do. And so in one sense, he could pick anybody. And so in the sovereign way in which he chooses person and timing, there's usually an unfolding story that's connected to that. And so what's dear to me isn't just that God did something, but that in the doing, our hearts were knit together, that, that my heart was knit to Brandon and, and this spiritual family. And, um, and that, there's a story now. I mean, that's the glory of the age to come. It's funny because I was sitting there in the first service. I was just having this random moment with the Lord in the worship time during the first service. and I, I, I needed a minute to process it. But I was just sitting here, I was just sitting there and the most random thought hit me. Like, what are we going to do in the age to come when we all are kind of on the same page with who God is? It feels like so much of my ministry and so much of my life is trying to get believers on the same page with who God is. And, um, and so I'm just sitting there for service going, what's this going to look like, you know, 10,000 years from now when we're on the, you know, new heavens, new earth. Heaven and earth have come together. Uh, I mean, you, you do know, I mean, part of my, so much of my life is going, hey, the Bible says that heaven comes down and joins to the earth. We don't become disembodied ghosts that go to a cloud. But that, that glorious diamond city with a sea of crystal on fire and a throne with angels around it, 10,000 times 10,000, as Ryan said earlier, 100 million angels. And, and it's really 10,000 times 10,000 because that's the highest number that the Hebrew mind could conceive. That's what Daniel was trying to communicate in Daniel 7, 10,000 times 10,000 angels. And, you know, all of that with him, with the Father, is going to come down and join to the earth. And so, the, so this, this earth, you know, if you like it, you get to keep it. And so the, if, you, if you dream of, man, someday I want to go to Tuscany or Maui, you will. It's not going anywhere. It is really not going anywhere. Like, that's the, that's the wait, I thought this was all going to get destroyed and we we're going to be in a cloud. No, this, Genesis 2, was made and God called it good. And this which he made and called good, he purposed in his heart as the infinite one to create a place and create beings to populate that place. And he purposed in his heart, which already tells us something ridiculous about him. He purposed in his heart to dwell with the people he made in the place that he made for them. That's the, that's the crazy thing about this story is that an infinite God 
who transcends time and space and place, enters into time and space and place, very limited. And you're going, well, how is that possible? How does an infinite God inhabit a very small planet? Just think about Israel, a very infinite God inhabited a small room, a small box, you know. In, in a nation the size of New Jersey, he inhabited a room in that nation and said, hey, this is the start. When, I mean, just, I'm going to keep going here. Just think about this. Just think about this. Here's the God that made heaven and earth. Here's the place that he made. Here's the people that he set on the place that he made. And he said, I'm a father. And hey there. <laughs> he said, let there be light. <laughs> he said, he makes this place. He makes this space. And in making this space, the two parties, the people he made and him, come into conflict. There's a war that breaks out in that space. It's, a, it's not just a sharp disagreement. It's a Genesis 3 revolt. It's a rebellion. It's an overthrow, an attempted overthrow. And the attempted overthrow is the violation of his boundaries to lay hold of life as we wanted it to be. Knowledge apart from him. That When they grabbed a hold of the fruit of that tree, they declared, we want knowledge apart from you, which is another way of saying, we want you out of here. That's the... When they finally gave in to the temptation, they were declaring their desire for God to depart the field and for them to be able to have it. That's just incredible. God makes the place, makes the space, says, I want to I live here with you. I want to be with you. I want to be with you. And they declared in rebellion and wickedness, we don't. We don't want that. And so now two parties are massively at odds with one another in terms of what they want. God says, I want to be with you. And the human race goes, we don't want that. And so the all-powerful, infinite being who made the space, this tells you everything you need to know about God if you knew nothing about him, declares, in the war between the two of us, I'll surrender for a moment. I'll leave this place. That just never happens. I mean, think about... If anybody here is a military history nerd, I'm a mild military history nerd, the, 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 the more powerful force never leaves the field. They keep going until the, until the opposing force is humiliated and no hope of, you know, a reprisal of the conflict. I mean, like Assyria would, would take a conquered nation and then just scatter them so they'd have no national identity ever again. So they couldn't rally around their national identity and try to take over again. That's what powerful entities do. Powerful entities make sure that the less powerful never threaten their power. But the most powerful entity, the most powerful being, when a very powerless created being threatens his power, he goes, rather than destroy you and start again, I mean, he could have done shmadam and give. You know what I mean? Like he could have, he could have just went and boop, and look at that. We got two, and maybe they'll comply this time. And, you know, it, but suddenly, rather than destroy them, he goes, no, I'll depart. I'll depart. I'll leave. The, that which we understand is heaven. That which we understand is the throne. That which we understand is the place that God occupies. He took that place somewhere else and separated himself, and chose the separation until there could be reconciliation. That's unbelievable. Already, I mean, it, already the accusations in our heart about God and how he feels about us should start right there. No, wait, when there was a conflict, he yielded. Yes, he is a king. Yes, he is God. Yes, he is Lord. Yes, he is the, the almighty one. But the way that he uses that power is so unlike how we use power. He is so tender and so kind and so willing to withdraw for a moment. But from that point forward, there is this problem. There is this problem. And the problem is for God and man to occupy the same space at the same time means something has to change or be destroyed. That's the dilemma from that point forward. It's the dilemma of holiness. And the dilemma of holiness is God wants to be with you and he wants to be here and he wants that more than anyone's ever wanted anything. And you go, well, where are you then? And just next time you go, where are you, God? Why aren't you here? Just 
Know that there's a father on the other side of that cry going, you don't get how bad I want to be there, but you also don't get how destroyed you'd be if I came. There's a dilemma of holiness. The dilemma of holiness is that sinful man and a holy God can't occupy the same space at the same time. And yet the, the love that burns in his heart and the ache to be with us I mean, here's the thing. If you start connecting the dots with what I'm saying, this is, this is kind of a weird application point, especially if you're a new Christian. This, what I'm going to say next is going to sound more impossible than a man being raised from the dead. If you connect with what I'm saying, you'll fall in love with the book of Leviticus. You actually will. You'll fall in love with the book of Leviticus because right now you're going, oh, get the sacrifice a bull and a cow and put your hand on its head and make sure you burn the entrails. Like, I don't That doesn't sound like a book I'm going to fall in love with. No, you're going to fall in love with the God of that book that's declaring what it takes in the ache of his heart at that time to dwell in the same physical space as sinful man. Because that's what, that's what the Pentateuch was. The Pentateuch was that moment where the first five books of the Bible, the, those first five books of the Bible, it's about the war that breaks out and God's willingness to withdraw. To, and, then, and then as he withdraws, things get really bad. Things get really bad, like really bad. I mean, God withdrew. And so the earth is accursed. Romans 8, Paul says the earth was subjected. It was handed to futility. It was accursed, but in hope. This wasn't the permanent state or the permanent condition of the earth. Part of the reason why the gospel is good news is because it's the beginning of the redemption of the earth, not just of human beings. It's good news because the earth was never meant to be stuck in futility. Like if you look around and you go, man, I just, it's so messed up. The world's so jacked up. The Lord goes, oh, believe me, I know. <laughs> oh, I heard you do anything about it. I'm doing something about it. You don't like the pace by which I'm going, but hopefully you'll like it when you understand your survival depended on me doing it this way. You might not like how slow it seems to you, but a billion years from now, you'll go, I can't believe how fast you did that. Because the dilemma of holiness and the dilemma of the destructive dynamics of the incompatibility of fallen man with holy God, but connected to the ache of his heart to be reunited with his family. He wants to be here. He wants to be here. And so... He withdraws, and things get really bad. I mean, really bad. Really, 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 really bad. Genesis 6, bad. I mean, demons and immorality and murder, and the human race almost extinguishes itself, and there's only one family left that loves God. And so God has, it's an ache in his heart that he expresses in the chapter. It, with an ache in his heart, he goes, I'll, I'll, I, I have to send a flood but by the end of the story in that passage, he goes, but I'm determined to never do it this way again. I am determined to never do it this way again. I'm going to find a way where there seems to be no way with creation that does not want me here and will go to any lengths to keep me out, including the extermination of the people that want me here. That's the drama of Genesis 6. The human race was so committed to that rebellion that they would do anything to keep God out, including the extermination of the people that wanted him here. When you read Genesis, you're going, wait, where did you get that? In Genesis, men begin to call on the name of the Lord. They begin to build altars and they begin to do prayer meetings. You see it. If you ever wondered, you're like, what's the, what, what in the world? This, you can title this sermon. The first sermon in the first service is very different than this one. I did the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6. It was really good. Go listen to it sometime. This is different. This is the secret history of prayer as it relates to this weird concept that I want to encourage you to fight for called sacred space. Sacred space. It's, it's why we don't just have a prayer life in our homes. It's why we get in our car and drive somewhere to be together. That's what I'm giving you right now, the secret history of prayer from the Pentateuch and beyond. That's just, I'm just kind of getting you on board with something. It's a little like, very, it's very new because no one ever reads the first five books of the Bible ever. But... <laughs> So the, but it's kind of cool to hear our story, right? This is our story. And when you get our story, you start fighting for it a different way. It's like, no, I want to, this is our inheritance. Yeah, right. And so the, and so what would be going to happen is it says very early on in Genesis, it said men began to call upon the name of the Lord. 
And they did this strange thing that we don't get today. We think it's really weird. They did something called burnt offerings. And you're going, what is that about? Why did they do burnt offerings? And the phrase that, the, the, that Moses used is the phrase sweet aroma. Sweet aroma. And you're going, why did they have to kill an animal? Which Moses is very clear about the why in Genesis. He goes, there's something about blood. It's, it's life for life, blood for blood. The, the sin, the rebellion has a consequence and a cost. And so, the, and so that consequence, that cost to our rebellion, which is still true today, by the way, just because we're in the new covenant, it's still true. Sin has a cost. Rebellion has a cost. And it's related to what I've been saying, the dilemma of holiness as it relates to sinful man and the incompatibility. The cost of sin, the cost of rebellion against God is the, is the withdrawal of his presence. God cannot, I mean, God can do anything he wants to, but God will not occupy the same space as sinful man lest he destroy. He gives time to repent. He desires that none should perish. He desires that all men will be saved and come to the knowledge of God, knowledge of the truth. Because God desires to occupy this space with repentant people that love him. And he's, he, he, when you read the Bible, it's the story of a holy God buying time for people to repent rather than invading. Because we always go that way. We go, God, we just want you to invade. No, 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 read your Bible. God constantly says phrases like through Isaiah and Isaiah 66, prepare a place for me. Prepare a place for me. Wait, why do I have to prepare? I don't want to prepare. I just want you. I don't want a visitation. I want a habitation. Yes, and I want you to survive. I love your little conference poster cliches. Well, I want more of your presence. Yes, I want that more than you want that. If you want it at a 5 out of 10, I promise you, I, the Lord, am at least a 5.1. I want wheelchair guys to get up. Yes, I want that too, but I also don't want to destroy your life when that begins to happen to you. Like, what? No. I mean, we're so naive. The things that we want of God, we're so naive. And he is a father who is not. He goes, no, I know what happens when I show up. Moses, send in, go with an angel. No, Lord, unthinkable. You must come with us. No, Moses, you don't get it. If I come, if I'm with you, like if you sin, plagues break out and people die. The ground swallows up and, and, and swallows up complainers. Like, like we were thinking to ourselves, how come the ground doesn't open up when people complain about Pastor Brandon? He must not be anointed. No, you must not have presence. When the holy God lives in your midst, the accountability goes up. Not because God's more angry, he's just more present. God more present, he's going, I don't, it's not that I want to destroy you by my presence. It's that I am who I am and I don't change. I'm not angry at you. This isn't a product of my emotion. This is me being a nuclear reactor and you naively wandering in without a radiation suit. I am who I am, and therefore in meekness I restrain to buy time for you to be like me so that I can be with you. I want to, so prepare a place for me. So men begin to call upon the name of the Lord, and they begin to do burnt offerings. And, and what's the point of that? The point of that was there's a cost. The cost is the withdrawal of my presence. And so by taking something costly, which would be an animal that you own. And that animal that you own would represent, you know, a month's worth of dinners. I mean, it was costly. And you would sacrifice that animal, and then you would burn it. And the reason it was a pleasing aroma is because it was man's declaration. I'm willing, I'm willing to do the costly if it means having your presence. I'm willing to, to pay a price if it means your presence. We want all that comes with your presence. Now, for us, kind of modern, spirit-filled Christians, that means, you know, I'll, I'll show up to the, to the meeting, and I'll give, and I'll try to serve in the church if it means I feel you more. That's not what they're thinking in Genesis. They're thinking like, again, really kind of random reference. They're thinking like Obed-Edom's house. When you bring the presence of God into your house, it's an explosion of blessing and favor and activity and crazy things that happen. 
And so they're, they're wanting the, the burnt offering in Genesis was the invitation of God's presence. They're, they're saying, God, come. We want a little more of you here. As much as we can have right now, we're aching for you to be with us. It is not anywhere near your ache to be with us. We're so dull and distracted and we're so kind of into ourselves. But for this moment, and that's why it's called a pleasing aroma, for this moment, our eyes are on you and we want you here. And God goes, that moves me. I love that little phrase in Song of Solomon. Just one little weak glance of your eye moves, moves my heart. I mean, the Lord uses more intense language. that it ravishes my heart. It, it absolutely just touches me in a deep way of which you can't even comprehend how much it moves me when you look my way and want me with you. Most of the human race never looks my way. Most of the human race uses my name as a curse word. Most of the human race blames me for all of their problems. Most of the human race talks to me in their most grave time of need but has no interest in me, just the solution that they think I provide. So most of the human race doesn't want to know me and most of the human race doesn't want to be with me and most of the human race definitely doesn't want my presence because of the destructive inconvenience that it is for real. I mean, just the history of revival is not pretty because it's the invasion of God's presence in a way that makes people really mad because they didn't want him here. That was the problem from the beginning. But then a whole bunch of like young people start praying and God goes, I'll answer them. And boom, he comes in power a little more. But everybody else goes, what happened? We did not want that. We've never read Genesis 3, but we are in. (laughs) We agree. We don't want that. That's, Paul calls that in 2 Thessalonians 2. I know I'm throwing a lot of passages at you. I'm not throwing them at you so that you remember them. I'm just wanting us to feel the story a bit. Paul calls that the mystery of iniquity, the mystery of lawlessness, the mystery of the hidden rage of the heart against God. It's been there from the beginning. We don't want you here. What, what we don't want to admit, because, again, we, we tend to think of ourselves as the fervent ones, the dedicated ones. What we don't want to admit is that there's a hidden part in our own heart of that Genesis 3 residue by which we go, we actually don't want you here. We want you here on our terms, and we want you here in a way that makes our life work, but we don't actually want you in full as you are in a way that's really inconvenient for my agenda. That's the, that's the dilemma. But again, God the Father, he, he's not bothered by that in the most merciful, tender way. I mean, he's bothered as a father going, I want to get that out of you. But, uh, but he's not bothered going, I am so mad at you for feeling that way. He goes, no, I, I know what's happening in the human heart. I know that you're praying for me to come and my presence and that. And mostly you want kind of a sweet, memorable altar call. And you mostly kind of want a cool worship night where you feel me more. Because I love that. Because I really love that. I love that you want that. But what I want more than anyone has ever wanted anything. And I want it to a degree that's a bottomless pit of jealous fire. I want it with a consuming want. That is so terrifyingly vast that it's like a black hole of desire. It's an ache deep within me that's far beyond human comprehension. I want to be with you. I want to live with you. I want me. I want you. I want us as a family. I'm a father, not the CEO of Church Corp. I'm a father that wants to be with his family, and I want to live with you, not at a distance. I am signing up for a temporary distance for the preservation of people that I love. But that distance is temporary, and I am coming. Prepare a place. I am coming. Who of you, who, who will prepare a place for me? The Lord asked through Isaiah. Who are the meek and the contrite, the repentant and the humble that want me here, that know that Me being here is so far better than me being not. Pull back to the story. So they're calling on the name of the Lord. They're doing these burnt offerings, the sweet aroma of I want you, God. That's why it's a sweet aroma to the Lord. I want you. So they do these little sweet aroma kind of offerings like we want you here. But again, remember, the human race at that time is primarily dominated by 
we, we can't even grasp. Within living memory was we remember when God was on earth. And we remember our forefather Adam when he would walk with him. We remember that. We didn't want that. We don't want that. So the families that are doing the burnt offering, we want you. The other families are going, no, and they start systematically exterminating those families. That's Genesis 6. The, they start turning to the demonic, trying to get the counterfeit of the blessing and the power and the favor that comes with God's presence. They start trying to find it in the demonic, and they start exterminating the authentic. And so when you read the flood story, don't go, wow, God is so mad. <laughs> wow, God gets really, God is, that's so unfair of God. I don't get how a good God can do that to people. It's like, you don't get how bad the people are. And how far you have to take it for God to do that. It's a pain to his heart. He expresses that pain in Genesis 6. I don't want to do this. Oh, this is paining me. He says it in a funny way that's confusing if you don't get it. He goes, he goes I regret that I made man. He's not actually saying, I wish I didn't do this. That's, that's, God doesn't change. He knows what he's doing. The lamb was slain. Jesus, the plan for Jesus to go to the cross was formed before men were made. The lamb slain before the foundations of the world. The plan for Jesus to be born and go to the cross was, was born in the Father's heart before men were ever created. So he knew what it would come to. So that phrase, therefore, is expressing pain. Oh, it, it is, I would rather these people never existed than for me to have to do this right now. I don't want to do this, but I must, or they will kill every family that wants me on the earth. And the only thing left are the families that don't, and then they'll kill themselves. And so for the preservation of the human race, the Lord moves in a flood. It's really, it's not the one you heard in Sunday school. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, the flannel graph story was way kinder, and there were animals. What do you get to the part about the animals? The cute little lambs coming on the boat? I want that part of the story. <laughs> I mean, we don't even think about the fact that God says to Noah, hey, there's never been rain before, this thing called rain. The water's never come from the sky before, ever. But I'm going to make water come from the sky for the first time in such a catastrophic way that it's going to flood the earth. I want you to build a boat as a witness of what I'm going to do, and hopefully the rest of the human race will see a boat, get afraid and repent and join you on the boat. That's why Peter called him a preacher of righteousness. Because the boat was a sign of what God was going to do. Noah responds in faith before it makes sense to anybody. But the process, I mean, God could have just went, hey, Noah, I love your family, and all those other people are going to burn. So boat, get on. No, he goes, no, I want you to build a gigantic boat. It's going to take a long time, and you're going to look really stupid, but it's also mercy to the people that don't get what you're doing. And so all the people are, that really do want to kill you, they're going to come to you and they're going to go, what is that object? And you're going to say boat. And they're going to go, what's that? It's a thing that floats on water. And they're going to go, I don't understand why you need to build a thing that needs to float on water. We are hundreds of miles from bodies of water. And he's going to go, not for long. And they're going to go, what do you mean? Well, water's coming. That doesn't make any sense. Water's coming. Join me on the boat. That's why Peter called him a preacher of righteousness. Water's coming. Join me on the boat. He's preparing a place. He's preparing a righteous response to give people a way to repent. We can't ever call God unfair. And so, the, so he builds the boat, and then the next thing that God says is, when, when it's built, there's still going to be time for men to repent because it's going to take time to populate that boat with animals I want to preserve. Now Noah's going, wait, animals? What are you talking about? The animals are going to come. So, they, so that boat will be built for a while before that water comes from the sky and breaks out from the deep, and explodes from the deep. And so you'll have time. Well, like what animals? Well, well the ones that have been trying to kill you guys. Uh, they're, they're, there's some pretty deadly ones. Yeah, they're, they're coming. <laughs> it's like, what? Yeah, you're going to build a craft to navigate water when water comes, and it's going to be populated with animals that want to kill you. I mean, just think about it. This is a bizarre story. So bizarre. But afterwards, God makes a rainbow commitment. He makes a rainbow commitment. And he says, I, I am going to find a way to turn the hearts. Of, I, I, it is not going to come to this again. I'm going to find a way where there seems to be no way. 
Which is why, just for fun, for Bible dorks in the room, that's why when you get to Revelation 10, an angel comes to John with a rainbow crown. Because he's coming to John the Beloved at, at mankind's lowest moment, where the earth is filled with all manner of wickedness and murder, theft, sorcery, deception, immorality. The earth, it's, Jesus called it the days of Noah. As the days of Noah were, so will they be again, he said in Matthew 24. So, that, so that what I'm describing to you is not just kind of a cool history story. Jesus said, just so you know, that history, it's coming again. The days of Noah are coming. The days of Noah in which there's two families on the earth, the families that want me and the families that don't, and there's a conflict between those two families coming. So Jesus said in Matthew 24, it's like, that's really new to me. I don't understand what you're saying. I know, it's intense. So, but... But that's why we as believers, we have no fear of that prophecy because of that rainbow commitment. The rainbow commitment of that group that wants to exterminate you. I'm going to find a way to save as many as can be saved. As many as will turn. I'm going to send revival. I'm going to send the power of my spirit. That's Joel 2. I'm going to send a global move of the Holy Spirit beyond anything anyone's ever seen. I'm going to take the book of Acts. I'm going to do it on a global scale. That's the promise of Joel 2. I'm going to take the book of Acts, and I'm going to do it on a global scale. Why are you going to do that, Lord? Like, when I read the book of Acts, when you move in revival, it, like, creates dynamics. Because you're coming a little bit more. It's not the full coming of your holy presence. It's like a little, little taste of your presence. But that little taste called revival, that just turns cities upside down. That destabilizes economies. That messes up the tourist industry of Ephesus built around sin and prostitution. That puts mobsters out of business, and that makes them really angry. And it, it dethrones governors that are wicked, and it enthrones governors that are righteous because suddenly 300,000 are saved and the whole voting of a city changes. That... So that, that's, that's not so pretty because everybody wows at the revival message because nobody ever thinks about the Tuesday after revival. And how mad people are that the world as it was is no longer the world they live in and they want it back. Revival changed the world, but we never think about the people that went, yeah, nobody asked me. I didn't want it changed. It took me my whole life to figure out the rules of the game of how to get a job, how to get promoted, how to become the main guy that has the voice. I, it took me my whole life to learn the rules of this broken world, and you just changed all the rules with your little revival. <laughs> what a weird message for a Sunday morning. <laughs> it's, really, it's really coming, and so the... And so the Lord makes this rainbow commitment, this rainbow commitment of mercy. I will find a way to have mercy. So when you ask him someday, why did you do that Joel 2 global book of Acts just before you returned? Why did you do that Joel 2 global book of Acts, that, that Ephesian Jerusalem revival, that first great awakening, second great awakening, except everywhere on the earth at the same time? If anybody here remembers the Jesus movement in the 70s, just think that times 10,000 everywhere on the earth at the same time. Everywhere. And why would you do that? It's, it's that rainbow commitment I made. Building a boat was a witness and a sign, but I wanted a greater sign before my son returned. I made a mercy commitment to the human race before my son comes back to usher in my presence. In the same way that I buy time, I'm going to do whatever I can do to turn the hearts of men. But by the time I'm done, people will have no accusation against me as it relates to the depth men will go to reject me. We're going to see two things in the days ahead. We're going to see how far God will go to save the human race, but we're also going to see how far the human race will go to avoid being saved. When Jesus says the days of Noah are coming, that's what that sentence means. How far I'll go to save men but how far men will go to not be saved. That's the part of the story we don't like, we don't want to talk about, we don't want to, we don't want to acknowledge that part of the story, but as long as God's highest end is love, then man's reality will be free will. And as long as there is free will to choose love, there's the option of choosing not love, and human history is filled with people that make that choice with bitterness. 
and anger and rage. And so the Lord makes this commitment. Now, now here, here it is. He goes, he goes I'm going to do two things. I'm going to make a commitment to man. I'm going to do everything I can do. Apart from violating the free will of men. That's what the rainbow commitment is. I'm going to do, do everything I can do within my power to turn the hearts of men without violating their free will. In other words, I'm going to, I mean, it's a really crazy plan. I'm going to raise up this thing called the church and she's going to be known as my bride, the bride for my son and the bride for my son. I'm going to move through her and in the same way that I, I come as a man so that men can know me and understand me and I, I come in human language so that you can grasp me. I, I'm Jesus. I, I come as a man. In the same way, I'm going to empower my church to express me. I'm going to fill the earth with my church, and I'm going to fill the church with me, and I'm going to cause the church to express me to the nations. I'm going to give, and then I'm going to send power to that church to amplify. It's, I'm going to give them a big microphone so that all the nations hear them. I mean, you'll, by the time you're done, you're going to say, Revelation 15, great and marvelous are your works. Just and true are your ways. I have no argument with your leadership and how you did this. You're going to come and judge, and I have no argument. That's also part of the delay. If you're going, God, our prayers. We've been doing prayer meetings for years, and we've never seen revival. He's going, just trust me. I'm really good at this. I'm really skillful, and even my delay is meant for your good, and my delay isn't just buying time for them to be saved. My delay is buying time for you to get converted to how I lead. I want you to like how I do this, but you don't grasp what I'm doing. So I want to fill you with my word. I want to fill you with song. I want to fill you with my love. I want to take time to keep you in the game. I want to get them into the family, but I want to keep you in the family too. And so I keep you in the family and I keep you out of offense in the delay by helping you understand why I do what I do, which is so humble when you think about it because he's the creator king. He didn't have to explain himself. He could just say, I'm the, he, could just, he could just end of the book of Jobus. <laughs> What's the end of the book of Job? <laughs> so you, you want to figure out why I do what I do, Job. You and your buddies that have theories on why I do what I do. You want to figure this out? Here's the thing. Were you there when I made the crocodile? Were you there when I formed the human spirit and put it in people? Were you there when I handcrafted the forests? Were you there when I did any of that? Can you grasp at all what I've done to sew and weave this story and create creatures and human beings? I could explain to you, but is that going to help you really? Job puts his face in the dust. Yeah, I can't. I don't, I don't know what's going on anymore. <laughs> I mean, think about that. God could end every sentence, end of book of Job-like. Where are you, God? Why aren't you coming for my Aunt Ethel? <laughs> she needs you and you weren't there. I was super duper there, but I was there in a way that didn't kill your Aunt Ethel or you. I'm, I'm more there emotionally. I'm more there passion, passionately. I'm more there with zeal and jealousy than you could ever grasp. But if I were to explain to you all the things, would it really help you? <laughs> oh, face in the dust, you're right. I don't get it. I mean, he could really create her king all the time. Because I'm, I, I, don't, I don't want to. I don't want to do creator king. I want to do father. Yeah. I want you to know me. So I'll, I'll come down and come near and I'll explain myself to you and help you understand why I do what I do. To keep you in this game, not, to not get you weary and discouraged and quitting. It's like, you are so humble. So he makes this commitment. He goes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show mercy to the human race. I'm going to find a way to do this. But then here's the kind of fun one. This one's for fun. This is not, not necessarily going to make your prayer life awesome, but it's a cool kind of like, huh, he makes not just a covenant with us, the human race, he makes a covenant with creation. That's what Paul's talking about in Romans 8 when he says all creation waits and groans for the sons of God, the redeemed ones, the resurrected saints to appear. Because creation's been subjected to futility. It's been subjected to a curse, but in hopes that, that this is a temporary thing. That, that a broken world, saturated and defiled by sin, would someday be cleansed and restored. That's what Paul's saying in Romans 8. 
that our, our good news began with the coming of Jesus because it, it announced the beginning of a plan to renew men who would renew and cleanse the earth. The, the, that's the glory of it. This earth. And so God makes a commitment to creation. He goes, I, I make a commitment to you. And, and he makes this covenant, the Noahic covenant. It's a covenant that there will always be 24-hour days, and there will always be 365-day years. In other words, he actually makes a covenant. The earth will always spin, and it will always go around the sun. There will always be sunrise, and there will always be sunset. There will always be four seasons. The, in the Bible is a covenant commitment of our creator to always have winter. Because there's some people that love it. I hate it. I'm so bitter at you for celebrating spring in February. <laughs> that makes me so angry. It was three in Kansas City when I was on my way here. and You guys are talking about spring in February. Well, we won the Super Bowl. So the... Uh... <laughs> You knew I was going to sneak that in. You knew I was going to sneak it in somewhere. I've been waiting for my shot. And it was out of bitterness. So, <laughs> so he makes a commitment to creation. I'm going, to, I'm going to find a way to turn their hearts if their hearts can be turned. And I'm going to find a way to get you out of this jam of being defiled by their sin. He loved what he made. He loved what he made. That's Genesis 2. He made it and called it good. He loved what he made. He loves this. That's why there's so many forever passages in the Bible. He loved the world he made for us. Because he made it not just for us. He made it for him. He loves the world that he made. He doesn't want us to die and go to heaven. That's Greek. That's the Greek version that's completely disconnected from a Hebrew God who, who really is aching to come back. To come back in full. To come back in the fullness of his holiness. To be here in his, with his family, but as he is without restraint. That's the dream of God's heart. If you ever wondered what God's dream was. Because you know our dreams are, I want to be famous. or Our dreams are, I want lots of followers on YouTube. or I mean the dreams of our grandchildren. I want so many followers on TikTok. It's like, ah, those are just so, I mean our dreams are some of the dumbest dreams. I want a promotion. I want good vacations. We just have all these dreams with Christian language on it, and we call it favor. <laughs> but it's like when we, when we connect to our story and the God of our story, we go, wait, your dream is so simple but so beautiful. You want to be here with us in full without restraint. You want unrestrained you. You want to be yourself with us. Which means that we need to go to war against all the areas in our heart that doesn't want you to be yourself. Ah, he goes, yeah, that's, that's the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are the terms by which I live with you. And the sacrificial system back in the day was representative of the cost. Because if you want me with you, here are the terms. They're non-negotiable because it's not just that I want you to do those things. I am those things. Therefore, you need to not just not do those things and high five. You need to actually become like me. You need to not be that. There's a spirit of murder operating in you. There's a spirit of covetousness operating in you. There's a, there's a spirit of deception operating in you. There are things happening in you that are not of me. And therefore, we can't occupy the same space. These are the terms. It's not that I'm mad at you. It's not that I don't like you. It's not that I'm annoyed by you. It's not that I'm super frustrated like, oh, no, how are we going to get them out of this dilemma? I'm so worried. Oh, no, their kids aren't following me. I'm so stressed. He goes, no, 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 I'm really good at this. I just need you to know why I'm not with you more. I want to be with everything in my being. He wants to be with us more than anyone has ever wanted anything. But, he's, but these are the terms. They're non-negotiable. I come starring me and I can't change. I won't change. So I am this. I am this. But, but the beauty of the Mosaic Covenant, so, so we... we the beauty of the Mosaic Covenant is God goes, but here, I'm going to plant a flag. I'm going to establish a sign, a small token of my ache to be with you. 
I'll send my manifest presence to the Holy of Holies. A little bit of my presence. But here's the cost. Here's what you have to do to maintain the sacred space and keep it holy and sacred. To keep it set apart. Here's what you have to do. If you want my presence, it has to be on these terms. And when you violate these terms, it's, it has this cost. If you want my presence, that's what it means. These terms, this cost. That's why the new covenant, the gospel, is such glorious, amazing news. Because the Lord said, you're going to continue to violate these terms, and you'll never be able to pay the cost, and I really want to be with you. So therefore, I will be born into the lineage of man. I will become a man, and I will observe the terms, and having observed them, I'll still pay the price. I'll still pay the cost. So that in the same way that I planted my flag, the flag of my presence in Israel, and said, here, a little bit of me is dwelling. It's me as your neighbor. It really is causing you a lot of trouble. But I'm hoping by the end you'll say it was worth it. They didn't, by the way, because of that thing in our hearts that we never address. They didn't say it was worth it. In fact, they said this isn't worth it. That's the, that's the battle. That's the war. Do we want you? And when we get you, is it worth it? That's the battle. So then the new covenant, he goes, now that my son has observed the terms and paid the price, I can begin filling the earth with my presence by beginning with you, filling you with my presence, putting my spirit in you. Then when two or more of you gather, there I am in your midst. You indwelling Holy Spirit people that gather together have more of me in their midst, more of my presence, more of my presence. He goes, so we can begin with you. And beginning with you, you can now begin to prepare a place for me. You can begin to ache and to long for more of me. You can be a witness on the earth, that there's a people that want me with them. And then in various times and seasons, I'll give you a little more of me. I'll be in your midst in powerful ways. But I want to help you at the end of it say that it was worth it. That's the, that's the fight. To become a people of prayer is a big statement. To become a people of prayer and a people of power is a bigger statement because what you're saying in the most non-sentimental, non-American cultural way, I want to become a people of the presence. But, but the reason that I don't always like saying that is because we say it from a place of naive sentimentality. Oh, I want his presence. No, 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 you don't get it. You don't get it. I mean, we're talking about the man who when he fully reveals himself to his dearest friend, John, Revelation 1, falls over like a dead man. There is such a thing as too much beauty. It fries our circuits. We can't actually grasp it. We can't actually figure out what's going on, and we just... He just reveals a little more of himself in glory, and it's too much for John to handle. We don't think about that. We don't think about... Revelation 5, when, he, when the Father shows his face to creation, it's almost too much for creation to handle. That's the, the intense language that John uses, the heaven and the earth flee away. It's about, here I am. <laughs> like it's, it's too much. It's too much. It's going, no, I want you to want me. And as I give myself to you, I want you to say it was worth it. I want you to fight for my presence in your midst which means love one another, pray for one another, teach one another, go in deep to the word together, get into who I am and talk about me together. As you talk about me, as you talk about who I am, and as you pray together, as you talk about me together, as you pray together, as you fight for one another to keep doing those two things, I mean, that's church in its most raw, basic form. Talk about me together, pray with with one another to me, 
and keep fighting for one another to keep doing those two things when life gets funny. No, stop. Fix your marriage. Love your wife better so that we can talk about Jesus together and pray together. Where? Here. Let's fight for, let's fight for a place. Let's fight for a sacred space for his presence. Let's fight for that sweet aroma of Jesus in our midst. Let's fight for more of him here, as much as we can have. Let's fight for that. We want that. And then as, as he begins to move in our midst, let's keep our hearts alive so that we don't get bit by the cynicism and the frustration and the, the hidden rage. And I didn't want it like this. And we go, it wasn't worth it. Cost me too much. I lost too much. So much of my ministry life is, I mean, I've been ministering long enough now, good 25 years plus. I've been ministering long enough now that I've got enough people that are still doing it and blesses me. They're still going for it and it blesses me. They're still fighting for, for prayer and power and presence. I love it. And they're fighting for the person of Jesus to be more magnified in their understanding, which is how we do it. But I've also gotten my rearview mirror so many that just decided this isn't worth it. This isn't worth it. Peter called that short-sighted. Because that's short-sighted. This is just a moment. This is just a little while. This fight is intense. This fight is happening within us. The part of us that wants God and the part of us that doesn't. And it really is raging within us. And we really need help to win it. And it really does take staying with it a long time for the part of us that wants God to be stronger than the part of us that doesn't. It takes staying with it. That's why God, that's why God made the gathering of the assembly, Hebrews, non-negotiable. That's why God made sacred space a thing and prayer meetings a thing. It's like, why can't I just have a prayer life where I don't have to get in my car and be with them? Because <laughs> no, it's non-negotiable. You've got to be together. You got to be together. You got to fight for the space because you're fighting for my presence in your place. You got to do that together. Lord, help us. Oh, thank you. Let's uh, let's stand. So yeah, first service sermon was good. <laughs> now, sometimes we don't understand why we do prayer meetings. Don't we just want to pray more? Yes, you're, it's really simple. You're more likely to pray more if other people are expecting you to show up. I mean, it really does, in that sense, it's so simple, but there's a lot more going on than that. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. You got thoughts? No, I don't. I really don't. I preached a sermon I didn't know I was going to preach that I feel like I need to go back and listen to. <laughs> I feel like we all shoved our head in a fire hydrant just for this last 30 minutes. Let's just respond in prayer. You know, again, this is a, a special weekend. and I, I, I trust Dave. known him for a long time, seen his sensitivity to the Spirit. And, and what I love about a morning like this is his freedom to be able to express what I feel God is speaking to us. So, Holy Spirit, we just thank you. Close your eyes around the room. Do your work. There's a call. Pursuing prayer with intentionality. Of making our hearts a habitation of your presence. Sacred space. God, we will never look back at those stories again the same way. Stories that have been housed in judgment see with mercy and grace invitation to relationship just again with what Dave shared you have felt this stirring these last 30 40 minutes we see you know, I feel God is drawing me into making that secret space and I don't know what it looks like I know it's gonna be weak I know it's gonna be fumbling you saying you know I know this is this is an important moment for me to make a decision to commit to sacred space. Just get out of your chair. Let's come down to the front right now. So, you know, I feel that God is saying, 
Prayer needs to be a focus in my life. Sacred space, intentionality with the presence of God, the secret place, whatever that word is. You say, you know, I need to make a commitment. Just just come down. We're going to pray for you. He bought me time. (laughs) No, I feel like there's even something more intense the Lord wants to... I, I know why I shared this message. There's just been in our hearts a hidden, unperceived blind spot. It's what keeps us out of the prayer meetings. It's what keeps us kind of at a distance from one another. But actually kind of working very subtly, very hidden, just didn't know it was there, is a quiet accusation against God. I thought he just said it so well. Stories in the Old Testament wrapped in judgments against him. Even the accusations of people against God, even the atheist, you know, accusations, there's been a part of your heart that goes, yeah. I've watched this journey for years too, you know, the accusation against God related to hell, the lake of fire. So I've watched young men and women reformat their faith to remove hell, thinking that will solve the dilemma. But it doesn't, there's still the accusation against God. It, it's unperceived, they didn't know it was there. So then they go the next step and they go, well, all faiths are right. I can't say anybody's wrong. And they think that'll deal with their accusation against the Lord. And it doesn't. So then they go the extra mile and they finally come all the way back around and they go, I gotta be honest about what that book actually says and I gotta be honest that I don't like it. And that's when they walk away from the faith. I've seen so many go on that journey because they don't want to deal with what the book actually says and the God who actually is the God of that book. And rather than deal with the accusation against that God, we just try to rewrite that book. I've seen that too much now, actually. It hurts my heart. But but it takes a bit of vulnerability and honesty because we don't want to be the person that questions and doubts. We want to be the champion of faith that's only spiritual and awesome. Just kill that. That ain't going to help you. Let's just go, yeah, you know what? Yeah, me. I got those. It's time to actually say that I do and ask God for help. I've got, I've had questions about his character. I've had questions about his leadership. I've had questions about his judgment. And rather than rewrite the book to make my questions feel better, I want to deal with that accusation. I, I, if you're up here for Brandon's altar call, don't go anywhere. I want to, for real, we'll go back to that one. But I want to take a second. If you're here or there, wherever you are in the room, if you're going, you know what? That is me. This, I loved this sermon, but it also stirred up some accusations I didn't know I had. The reframing of the story made me realize, I, I, I love you, but I don't like you all the time. I love you but I don't quite know you that way and I don't like you in the places I don't know. And My heart's been kind of struggling in those areas related to your leadership. I have accusations. That's you right where you are. I want to invite you to close your eyes and just hold your hands out like you're receiving a gift. I want to, I want to pray for you. It's, we're, just, we're just doing a little repentance for a moment. Like I've got those. I want to acknowledge it. I want to say that I do, but ask you for help. You, you, knew, that, you knew they were there all along. You weren't never angry about them. You never rejected me related to them. You were patient with me in having them, but you want to start the conversation. You want to go, let's talk about them now without fear of rejection or shame. Let's talk about them. He's not threatened. Here we are. Here I am. Here I am, Lord. I've got them. I'm acknowledging there's a real part of my heart that as much as I want you here, there's a part of me that does not. I've wanted you on my terms. I've wanted you according to my definition of how I wanted life to be, how I, where I wanted life to go and what I wanted life to be about. And you were kind, and I didn't see it. But Lord, I did. I wanted you here, but on my terms. I've had accusations. And I'm asking right now, right here, wash me, wash me, wash my heart, wash my mind, Renew me, help me, start a conversation with me to wrestle through these. I I need your help. I need help. I can't get out of this by gritting my teeth and willing it away. My heart's wrestling. My heart's hurting in some areas, and I need you there. 
I'm asking for you to draw near to us in those accusations. Draw near to us in the wrestle. Speak to us. Help us. Minister to us. You love to do. You love to do it. You're such a good father. Not threatened at all. God, I'm asking the days ahead. Help us. In Jesus' name.